September 11th, 2018. High up in the skies, Air India 101 is approaching JFK International Airport for a second attempt to land. This plane has just suffered multiple sensitive instrument failures. After a 14 hour flight, they are running low on fuel. They have also lost the ILS, the device that helps the pilots land the plane, especially in poor weather. Outside the cockpit, it's raining heavily. With clouds all around them, the pilots are flying blind and it is next to impossible to spot the runway. Every passing minute, they are using up more fuel and they have to land now. The lives of 357 people on board now depends on what the pilots do in the next few minutes. Are they able to avoid another tragedy on September 11th in New York City? Let's find out. This is the story of Air India Flight 101. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? It's a warm autumn night at New Delhi's Indira Gandhi International Airport. Three 42 passengers and 15 crew members are preparing for their 14 hour flight to New York City. The United States is a popular destination for Indian students and tourists and the plane is at maximum capacity. This flight from Delhi's IGI to New York's JFK is Air India's flagship route. This flight takes the passengers over the polar route, flying over the rugged terrain of Pakistan, Russia, Finland, Greenland and Canada before entering the United States. The plane for today's flight is a Boeing 777-300 extended range twin jet. It's fitted with two GE90-115 Bravo engines. This plane was first delivered to Air India in 2009 and it has been in operation for over 9 years at the time of this incident flight. The 777 can be flown by two pilots. However, because this flight is 15 hours long and needs to cover over 7,500 miles, AI-101 has four pilots. Two serve as the main crew and the other two are the relief crew. The commander is Captain Rustam Palia, a 49-year-old with 3,500 hours on this type of aircraft. With him in the cockpit are Captain Vikas, Captain Shushant Singh and Captain D.S. Bhatti. It is the first time that the four of them are flying together. During the pre-flight briefing, the engineering staff report that the flight's auxiliary power unit isn't functioning. The APU on an aircraft like the Boeing 777ER is not typically considered critical for the safe operation of the plane during flight. The APU provides auxiliary power for various systems such as starting the engines or running electrical systems and providing air conditioning when the main engines are not running. However, it is not a primary propulsion system and it is generally not needed once the engines are running. Given this, the pilots determine that the issue is non-critical and decide to proceed with their flight to New York. With the possibility of inclement weather in New York City in the forecast, the captain opts to load an additional 800 kilos of fuel to reach an alternate airport if needed. This decision will end up being crucial. The crew asks for pushback and taxi clearance and the plane departs New Delhi at 0300 local time, delayed by around one hour. The departure itself is uneventful. The first signs of problems occur 40 minutes into the flight. Whilst over Pakistani airspace and just after reaching 30,000 feet, a warning message appears on the pilot's screen saying, Single Source Radio Altimeter. A radio altimeter is like a magic ruler for airplanes. It measures how high they are above the ground by sending invisible radio waves and timing how long they take to bounce back. This critical system helps pilot maintain the correct altitude and it also helps them ensure safe landings. The Boeing 777, like many modern commercial aircraft, is equipped with three radio altimeters for redundancy and safety. This redundancy ensures that if one radio altimeter fails, the aircraft can still rely on the other two and provide accurate altitude information. What this plane is telling the pilots is that multiple radio altimeters have failed and only one of the altimeters is now working. The problem is, how can you be sure that the one altimeter that is working is actually showing the correct height? Now, this isn't usually an issue in cruise flight because during cruise, 
a different type of altimeter called the barometric altimeter is used. The barometric altimeter uses the air pressure to determine how high they are above the sea level. It operates based on the principle that atmospheric pressure decreases with increasing altitude. But this is less accurate than the radio altimeter. The radio altimeter becomes very important when accurate information of height is crucial, like during takeoff and during landing. Keep this in mind for now, we'll come back to this later. The second issue appears when the flight is crossing the Atlantic Ocean. At this point, it is over 10 hours since the flight departed New Delhi and there are another 3 hours before it is time to land in New York. At this time, the pilots get a warning that their TCAS isn't working. TCAS, the Traffic Collision Avoidance System, is like a smart traffic cop for airplanes. It uses radar to detect other traffic, planes in the sky traffic, and if two planes get traffic, too close, traffic, it tells the pilots to climb or descend now. to avoid a collision. It helps keep the skies safe by preventing planes from crashing into each other. The loss of the TCAS itself is not a major concern during cruise flight as it is a backup system to prevent collisions. However, it is a handy wingman during takeoff and during landing when you are usually flying in a crowded airspace and your workload is very high. Now, these warnings start to concern the crew because it is unusual for unrelated instruments to all fail at the same time. The auxiliary power unit was not working prior to takeoff, the radio altimeters failed just after takeoff, and now the TCAS has also failed. The pilots are worried that there may be an underlying issue with the plane that's causing all these unrelated failures. However, there is not much that they can do at this point so they continue their flight to New York. It is now around 10 minutes past 6 in the morning in New York. The weather is overcast with rain, clouds and thunder. The meter indicates a visibility of quarter statute mile for runway 04 right and a vertical visibility of 200 feet. AI-101 enters the New York airspace and makes contact with the approach controller. Uh, good morning, Air India 101, uh, final 4 right. Air India 101, heading Kennedy Tower, good morning, you're following an Embraer short final, wind 040 at 4, RVR 3000, runway 4 right, clear to land. 4 right, clear to land, Air India 101. After obtaining their approach clearance for runway 4 right at JFK, the pilots attempt to use their ILS to capture the localizer and guide them towards the runway. However, try as hard as they may, the ILS isn't locking on to the localizer signals. Their instrument landing system has also failed. The ILS is like a super helpful GPS for planes when they are landing. It uses special radio signals and antennas on the runway to guide the plane down safely, showing the pilot where to go and how high they are. It's like following invisible lines in the sky to ensure that your plane lands smoothly, especially in bad weather. This system also enables the plane to auto land. But on this plane, the ILS device isn't locking onto the signals being sent from the runway. The crew manually points the plane at the correct heading and then tries what's called an LNAV VNAV approach. The LNAV VNAV approach uses GPS, similar to what you may have in your car, to guide the airplane close to the runway. However, unlike the ILS, the LNAV VNAV isn't precise and has a lateral precision of 0.3 nautical miles. Therefore, the pilots need to visually see the runway at their decision altitude before landing. If they aren't able to see the runway at their minimums, they need to go around and try again. As they close in on the runway, the pilots extend the landing gear and immediately another warning sound starts going off in the cockpit. This warning tells the pilots that their landing gear is not fully down and that immediate action needs to be taken. The pilots act quickly to check this new issue. And after going through the checklist, they find that the gear is indeed down and that it is a false alarm. This creates a significant distraction adding to their already heavy workload. At this point, the plane is covering 3-4 to four miles per minute. With all the instrument failures and incorrect gear warnings, the pilots are unable to stabilize the aircraft and decide to go around and try again. The aircraft climbs back to 2000 feet 
and now contacts the New York departure controller. The crew informs the ATC that they need longer holding vectors to try to solve the problems that they are having and that they are not ready for a second landing attempt just yet. Uh, Rina, uh, 101, uh, could we have uh, longer vectors? We were facing some uh, instrument uh, problems as well. Was that the reason for the go around? Because uh, we lost the uh, localizer and our minima change, there were a lot of issues involved. So we're trying to sort that out, uh, if we can even continue with this approach. Now to understand what happens next, you need to understand what a cloud ceiling is. A cloud ceiling is the height at which the lowest part of the clouds is above the ground. It tells pilots at what height above the ground they can start seeing the ground. If the plane had a working ILS and the ability to auto land, the pilots could land the plane with a cloud ceiling of zero feet. However, since the pilots are performing a non-precision approach, they need to visually see the runway to ensure that they are landing in the right place. For this, they require a minimum ceiling of 600 feet. JFK has a ceiling of 200 feet. Their alternate airports, Newark and Stewart, also have ceilings of 200 feet. Okay, well right now the weather that I have is showing um, indefinite ceiling 200 at Kennedy. Uh, RVR is uh, 4,500, so that's gotten a little bit better. So visibility is fine, but the problem we are facing is with the ceiling because we can't continue with the ILS with a ceiling of 200 because every time we try to lock on the uh, localizer, you know, the instrumentation does, that doesn't allow us to do that. Okay, so you, can't, you cannot do like an auto land or something? No, auto land is not available. We've got two radio altimeter failures. So we're on uh, one radio altimeter, we've got TCAT failures, we've got all multiple uh, instrument uh, failures. So what ceiling do you need? You know, anything above uh, like 600 or so. Okay, I got it. Okay, I understand now. Just uh, fly heading 220, let me find some weather, pull some weather up and let me find something. Okay, thanks. Another issue that the plane is facing is that the pilots want to conserve as much fuel as possible to allow them multiple go-arounds if needed. This means that they need to land at an airport near the New York area and cannot fly further out to Boston or Washington to land there. And um, just be, uh, before I, I, I go away, uh, what was your potential alternate? Uh, the primary alternate was uh, Newark and the secondary alternate is uh, Stewart, but both seem to be you know, in the same sort of situation. With every passing minute, they are depleting their fuel and are beginning to use their reserves. The additional 800 kilos that they loaded in Delhi are now proving to be helpful. Aaron D101 Heavy, I'm having trouble finding anything that's really that good. I have Albany is 600 feet overcast and Boston Logan would be uh, 500 overcast. Uh, Washington Dulles is, uh, is at 200 feet also. We were just checking uh, Boston as well because we're getting uh, a little low on the fuel as well. So we need to Right, yeah, higher, we can they burn a little less fuel, and then uh, I believe Pittsburgh is 2,500. That's, uh, we have to just check for the fuel as far as this goes. Okay, Air India 102 Heavy uh, heading 090, climbing maintain 5,000. Uh, 090, climbing maintain 5,000, Air India 101. Air India 101 Heavy, I think based on, on the weather that we have in the area and based on the forecast that I'm seeing, I think Bradley, Kilo Bravo, Delta Lima will be your, your best option. Uh, okay, and uh, what's the ceiling there? Okay, right now the ceiling that uh, uh, there is 500 overcast. Got a trend showing it's uh, the ceiling at uh, JSK is also improving a bit. I could try a VNAV approach and see, you know, it, it, it can take us down in a situation like this because we're really, you know, stuck and there's no fuel. The departure controller then tells the pilots about a new special METAR released by Newark that shows the ceiling has lifted to 400 feet. Newark just had a special, they're, and they're showing 400 overcast. They're, they just had a special at uh, 1205 Zulu, so about six minutes ago. Okay, so it's a bit uh, better now in uh, Newark, is that correct? Yes, sir. The, the, the weather came up to 400 feet overcast at Newark. The pilots decide to attempt to land at Newark with the 400 foot ceiling. Remember, this is still lower than the 600 feet that they initially wanted, so they are still not out of the woods. Problems that we are facing here, unable to uh, do the ILS, 
So I was going to try a uh, VNAV approach if in uh, Newark, if the ceiling is better than uh, JFK. Okay, so you want to do the VNAV approach into Newark, is that correct? Uh, that's right, that's the only option that we have because this island is unpredictable because every time we uh, turn towards the localizer, it's, uh, it's just gone. Okay, so your IOS is out of service on both, both sides of the airplane, right? Yeah, that's correct. And then the, uh, you said also the radar altimeter is around on both sides of the airplane? Uh, that's right, we are on a single radio altimeter now. At this point, the plane has just around 7,200 kilograms of fuel left. Just enough to complete the trip. Aaron, you wonder on it. Other than both ILSs, both radar altimeters, what other things have failed on the airplane? Single source uh, radio altimeter. We've got TCAS failure, no auto land, windshield system, auto speed brake, and APU is unserviceable as well. In a reminder of how precarious their position is, the controller asked the crew. So just when you get a chance, give me the people on board and the fuel on board, please. Uh, we have total of 370 and uh, fuel uh, 7,200. Uh, the pilots are then handed off to Newark approach controller, who clears them for the 04 right approach. Rita 101, now we are coming to Newark. Heading is uh, 290, descending 3000. Rita 101. Rita 101, heady. 210 miles from Dillon, turn right heading 010, meeting 3000, let's hold up the localizer, cleared I launch from wait for right approach. The controllers then scramble the emergency vehicles in case assistance is needed once the plane lands. Zero one heavy emergency personnel will be sending us. Good, Truck one, while we wait here, uh, nature of emergency is a uh, computer failure. Aircraft type is a uh, Boeing triple seven uh, whiskey model. Two hundred seventy souls on board, and uh, seventy-two thousand uh, kilos of fuel. At this point, the crew has been flying for over fourteen hours in a high-stress environment, trying to land a massive fully loaded airplane in one of the busiest air corridors in the world without all their usual instruments. And to add to that, when they look outside their cockpit, all they see is clouds. With each passing minute, the pilots hope that the clouds will lift and they will see the runway below. When passing 1000 feet, Captain Palia realizes that the plane is higher than their ideal descent path. If this isn't immediately corrected, the plane will have to go around a second time and use more fuel, which they don't have. They have to land now. Captain Palia corrects this by manually pushing the plane's nose down to get back to the ideal path. But this causes the plane to speed up further. At one point, the controller sees a warning on the screen indicating that the plane is too low to the ground and then relays this to the pilot. Go out to the left, you got to the middle, the altimeter is zero, fresh 3012. 3012, we're in the one. At 400 feet, they finally break through the clouds and see that they are too high and further right of where they need to be. Captain Palia urgently pushes the nose down and to the left to line the plane up with the center line. Finally, the plane lands safely on runway 4 right at Newark. The emergency services then get in touch with the pilots to ask them if they need any assistance, but the pilots decline. 10 minutes after they land, the entire airport is engulfed by a thunderstorm. If the crew had delayed their approach by 5 minutes or had to make a second go around, they may never have been able to land. Unfortunately, the root cause of these numerous instrument failures remains unknown as Air India has not released an incident report nor an investigation report. However, a prevailing hypothesis suggests that the aircraft's main computer, which controls the flight deck, diagnostic systems and maintenance systems, malfunctioned, presenting inaccurate values to the pilots. Despite being a crew of four individuals who had not previously flown together, the pilots demonstrate commendable crew resource management by effectively coordinating with each other and air traffic control, ultimately ensuring a safe landing of the plane. The plane is flown back to India the next day as a ferry flight for relocation. This is your captain speaking. I regret to inform you that this plane has hijacked. 
प्लीज ट्रस्ट मी आई एम ट्राइंग एवरीथिंग पॉसिबल टू मेक श्योर दैट वी ऑल रीच होम सेफली हाईजैक्ट इंडियन एयरलाइंस प्लेन इज फ्लाइंग ओवर पाकिस्तान द प्लेन हैज लेस देन 10 मिनट्स ऑफ फ्यूल रिमेनिंग अंडर प्रेशर फ्रॉम द हाईजैकर्स द प्लेन इज अप्रोचिंग लाहौर इंटरनेशनल एयरपोर्ट द कैप्टन रिक्वेस्ट लैंडिंग क्लीयरेंस फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान एटीसी बट दे डिनाई इट दे टर्न ऑफ द रनवे लाइट्स एंड ऑल नेविगेशन एड्स एट द एयरपोर्ट लाहौर शट्स डाउन इट्स एंटायर एयर स्पेस Pakistan threatens to shoot the plane down. The crew is flying completely blind over hostile territory. The hijackers demand the plane be landed immediately. Then a ray of hope. The captain sees a long line of lights in the distance. He has spotted the runway. He starts descending the plane. Landing gear is down. But as they keep going lower, they see something shocking. The outline of cars and trucks and people start becoming visible. They are about to land on a highway. For the passengers and crew of this Indian Airlines flight, this short one and a half hour journey is about to turn into days of terror. And by the time the story finishes, deadly chapters will be written in history, including that of the 9/11 attacks and the 2001 attack on the Indian Parliament. This is the story of Indian Airlines flight IC814. It's Christmas Eve 1999 and this is Tribhuvan International Airport in Kathmandu Nepal. Indian Airlines flight 814 and Airbus A300 is preparing for a short flight to India's capital New Delhi. In the cockpit conducting pre-flight checks is 37-year-old captain Devi Sharan. With him are first officer Rajendra Kumar and 58-year-old flight engineer Anil Kumar Jagia. Inside the terminal passengers line up for security check. and in that line are five men each holding a bag as each of the men pass through the detector there is a silent nod between them and the security officer over in pakistan dawood ibrahim one of india's most wanted makes a phone call his associate in kathmandu picks up hello dawood instructs them that these five men need to be let through security check at tribhuvan no questions asked okay Indian intelligence in Nepal intercepts this message and they learn that a plan to hijack an Indian plane in Kathmandu is underway. But what they don't know is which plane and what date the hijack is planned for. Indian intelligence in Kathmandu is handled by the research and analysis wing, RAW for short. Shashi Bhushan Tomar, a senior RAW officer, is posted at Kathmandu. He receives the intelligence about the impending attack, but Unfortunately, he rejects the information as a hoax and this message is not transmitted to raw leadership in Delhi. The men and the guns in their bags pass through security check at the airport. There are 178 passengers on board, many returning home from short holidays during the Christmas break. The year 2000 is one week away and this anticipation and positivity looking forward to a new beginning. The plane departs Kathmandu at 4 p.m. local time. The plane climbs to 10,000 feet. The seat belt signs are turned off. The plane enters Indian airspace. It's a short flight, so the flight crew begin in-flight refreshments. This was the queue. A man sitting in business class dons a ski mask and grabs senior flight attendant Anil Sharma. He tells Anil that he has a bomb. and the crew are to follow all his commands in the back of the plane the other hijackers have done the same and are now brandishing guns at the passengers and the crew the five hijackers call each other by code names chief burger doctor shankar and bola the chief hijacker orders anil sharma to take him to the cockpit remember this is pre 2001 and the cockpit doors don't have the same security precautions that they have today with a gun pointed at his head Chief orders Captain Sharan to turn the plane right and start flying west. They want to go to Lahore in Pakistan, and if he fails to obey, they will kill a passenger. Captain Sharan does not want to leave the Indian borders. In order to stall and buy some time, Captain Sharan tells the hijacker that they don't have enough fuel to go to Lahore. The hijacker asks him what his alternate airport is. Sharan responds that it's Bombay. Lahore is closer to Delhi than Bombay. If they have enough fuel for Bombay, then they have enough fuel for Lahore. 
The hijackers have done their homework and the captain's attempts to stall fails. Inside the cabin, the passengers are being segregated. The male passengers are being moved to the front of the plane and the female passengers and children are moved to the rear. Back in the cockpit, unseen by the hijackers, Captain Sharon sets the transponder to the hijack code 7500. This lets the Indian ATC know for the first time that IC814 has been hijacked. The time is 4.40 pm India time. The plane makes an unplanned right turn. The hijackers don't allow the captain to talk to Indian ATC. All that the ATC can see is that a hijacked Indian Airlines plane is flying towards Pakistan. Delhi ATC contacts the central government's crisis management group, headed by Union Secretary Prabhat Kumar. Unfortunately, it takes about an hour for the CMG to convene. Neither India's Intelligence Bureau nor the Research and Analysis Wing, who have both dealt with previous hijackings, are notified. So at this point, nobody from the Indian government is helping Captain Sharan. He needs to figure things out himself. He doesn't want the plane to leave the Indian borders. He believes that as long as the plane is within India, the Indian security forces will be able to engage the hijackers and free the hostages. So, to buy time, he slows the plane down by 40% to keep the plane within the borders for as long as possible. The plane is now flying over Punjab and it approaches the Pakistani border. They tune into Lahore ATC. The plane is squawking the hijack code, so Lahore knows that the Indian plane has been hijacked. Pakistan and India are not on friendly terms. They have just fought a war in Kargil five months ago and trust between the two nations is at an all-time low. Captain Sharan requests landing clearance but Pakistan flatly refuses to accept the plane into its territory. Pakistan goes one step further. They shut down the entire Lahore airspace. The captain needs help. Amritsar airport is just five minutes away. But the hijackers won't let the plane land in India. And now they are legitimately starting to run low on fuel. Half an hour passes. The plane is circling over the India-Pakistan border. Captain Sharon calls up Amritsar ATC. We have only one hour of fuel and Lahore is not letting us enter their airspace. Amritsar ATC does not have any training nor experience in handling a hijacking. And they have not received any directions from the central government so far. Please get permission to land at Lahore. Otherwise, they have already selected 10 people to kill. Captain Sharon continues to plead. With no help coming from India, Captain Sharon needs to take things into his own hands. He convinces the hijackers that since Pakistan isn't allowing them into their territory and since they are running terribly low on fuel, their only alternatives are to either land in Amritsar or to crash the plane into the ground. With no other options, the hijackers agree to landing in Amritsar. The plane lands at Amritsar's Raja Sansi airport, 50 kilometers to the east of Lahore at 6.44 pm India time. The hijacked Indian plane inside India is the best chance for the Indian commanders to free the hostages. But what happens next is a historic blunder. The crisis team at Amritsar received its first order from Delhi at 6.40 pm. They were to delay refueling for as long as possible and prevent the plane from taking off at any cost. Punjab police are ordered not to engage with the hijackers. They are instructed to wait for the Indian commandos to reach Amritsar. But the problem is that the commandos are still in Delhi, 500 kilometers away, and they haven't departed yet. Something, or someone, is holding them back. The hijackers are getting frustrated that the plane isn't being refueled as the captain had promised. They threaten to start killing people on board. And this threat alarms Delhi. Delhi orders the Amritsar crisis team to send a fuel truck to the plane, but to hide Punjab commandos inside the truck. They are to slash the tires and position the truck in front of the plane so that the plane cannot take off. The fuel truck with local commandos starts approaching the plane. The truck is approaching at a very high rate of speed and the ATC worries that the truck going that fast will make the hijackers suspicious. So, they instruct the driver to slow down. This order confuses the driver and he abruptly stops in the middle of the runway. This random stopping of the truck alarms the hijackers and they are convinced that the Indians are about to attack the plane. They panic and order the captain to take off immediately. That there is no fuel left in the plane is no consideration. The captain refuses. A standoff between the hijackers and the crew begins. 
but this will end in deadly consequences. One of the hijackers, Doctor, goes into the business class cabin and stabs Rupin Kathyal, a 25-year-old man returning from his honeymoon. In the cockpit, the chief hijacker begins a countdown and if the plane doesn't take off by the time he counts to 10, they'll continue killing more people. One, two, three, four. The captain is left with no choice. He announces to the ATC that they are taking off. We are all dying now. We are heading towards Lahore. The plane lifts off from Indian soil for the last time. Just as the plane takes off, the NSG commandos from Delhi arrive in Amritsar. Let me introduce you to the man sitting in seat 16C of this plane. Remember the raw official in Nepal, Shashi Bhushan Tumar, who was informed weeks earlier that a hijacking was going to happen, but dismissed that intel? As fate would have it, Shashi Bhushan Tumar is a passenger on this plane. Shashi Bhushan Tumar is married to the sister of N.K. Singh, the secretary to the Prime Minister. It is alleged that N.K. Singh made sure that no commando activity happened on the plane to ensure the safety of his brother-in-law and this caused a delay in the commandos reaching Amritsar. The plane slices through the darkness towards Pakistan. Although the Lahore airspace has already been shut down, the crew ignores it and crosses the border. Permission to land is once again denied. Pakistan threatens to shoot the plane down if they continue to fly in their territory, but the crew ignores this threat. To prevent the plane from landing, Pakistan turns off all navigation aids and the airport lights. Please let us land. We don't have any fuel left. As the captain continues to beg for permission, a low fuel warning starts blaring in the cockpit. With five minutes of fuel left, Captain Sharan decides to risk it. He sees a row of lights in the distance, which he assumes is the airport, and he starts descending towards it. As they get closer, he sees cars and bikes and people on the road. They are about to land in the middle of a highway. Pakistan is terrorized that they might end up having an Indian airplane crash in the middle of Lahore and they decide to allow the plane to land instead. The navigation aids and the runway lights are turned back on. The plane lands at 8 p.m. in the evening. A hijacked Indian plane is now inside Pakistan. What will Pakistan do? The plane is immediately surrounded by elite Pakistani commandos. Captain Sharon requests Pakistan to send the stairs so that women and children and the injured passenger can be offboarded but Pakistan refuses. They don't want to be seen as having anything to do with the hijacking. They want the plane to leave their country as soon as possible. Back in the cabin, the injured passenger is bleeding to death. The ATC informs the captain, We'll give you fuel if you want, but we will do so much. They refuse to allow the passengers to disembark. After three hours, and with a tank full of fuel, IC-814 takes off into the darkness of the night. Back in India, rumours that some passengers may have been killed spreads panic among the family and relatives of those on board. The hijackers order the plane to be flown to Kabul, Afghanistan. But you can't land at night at Kabul. So they choose Oman instead. Just like Pakistan, Oman refuses entry as well. So they divert to the UAE. Sometime during the night, unfortunately, Rupin Kathyal, who was stabbed by the hijackers, breeds his last. The UAE permits the plane to land at Al Minad Air Force Base near Dubai and it's around 3 a.m. local time. Having blundered the opportunity to carry out a commando operation on its own soil, India requests the UAE to permit Indian commandos to storm the plane in Dubai. But the UAE isn't willing to permit any foreign commando action on its soil. But they are able to negotiate the release of some passengers and the body of Rupin Kathyal in exchange for fuel. His wife Rachna Kathyal, who was seated in the back of the airplane, isn't even aware that her husband is dead. The plane is refueled and it takes off once again. The plane starts flying north. Destination unknown. The sun rises on day two of the hijacking. The plane is on the runway at Kandahar Airport in Afghanistan. This is going to be home for the next five days. In 1999, Afghanistan is controlled by the Taliban. 
The Taliban surround the plane with armed fighters and tanks, which they claim is to dissuade the hijackers from killing more people. India, on the other hand, believes that the hijackers are getting active support from the Taliban and from Pakistan's ISI, and that their safe exit from Afghanistan was guaranteed. The conditions on the plane are terrible. The plane is running low on food, and the passengers are being fed inconsistent meals. The toilets are overflowing. The hijackers have ordered all the windows to be shut. Windows down! Windows down, everyone! The hostages can't see anything outside, nor do they know what their fate is going to be. It's now day three of the hijacking. In India, pressure mounts on the Indian government. The Indians are yet to establish contact with the hijackers, and no one knows what the condition of the people on the plane is. On the 26th of December, External Affairs Minister Jashwan Singh is at a press conference about the hijacking when relatives of the passengers storm the meeting. The family of the hijacked passengers want the Indian government to meet any demands of the hijackers to free their loved ones. The Indian Prime Minister Vajpayee is opposed to the idea. We don't know what the hijackers want yet, but whatever it is, this is not the way to do it. On day 4 of the hijacking, the 27th of December, the Indian government's negotiations team finally lands in Afghanistan. Unknown to the Taliban and the hijackers, the Indians have a team of elite black cat commandos hidden on board. But as soon as the Indian plane comes to a stop, the Taliban surrounds it, taking offensive positions. With the Taliban militia surrounding the aircraft, a lightning strike by the hidden commandos is impossible anymore. India doesn't recognize the Taliban regime, but if they are to find a solution, they need to start talking to and working with them. The Indian team negotiates with the hijackers for over two days and obtain the entire list of their demands. The passengers are to be freed in exchange for three militants. Maulana Masood Azhar, the founder of Arkat ul Mujahideen, Ahmed Omar Saeed Sheikh, a British citizen and a follower of Maulana Masood Azhar, who has been arrested for the kidnapping of foreign nationals in Kashmir, and Mushtaq Ahmed Zargar, the chief commander of the militant group Al Umar Mujahideen. The three militants are released from jails from different parts of India and they are brought to Delhi. From there, they board a flight and are flown to Kandahar. On the 31st of December, the hijackers release all the prisoners. On board the plane, the passengers of IC-814 celebrate their freedom. India expected the Taliban to arrest the hijackers, but that did not happen. The Taliban leaders take the five hijackers in a car towards the border, the Pakistani border, and they escape from Kandahar as free men. Today's news from Pakistan that uh, two of the released persons have surfaced there only goes to confirm Pakistan is neck deep in this uh, dirty game of hijacking. Soon after his release, Maulana Masood Azhar moved back to Pakistan and founded the militant group Jaish A. Mohammed, which perpetrated the attack on the Indian parliament in 2001, which killed seven people and injured 18 more. He now lives a free man in Pakistan. Omar Sheikh was arrested in 2002 for the murder of Daniel Pearl, and he played a significant role in the planning of the September 11 attacks in the United States. Mushtaq Ahmed Zargar continues to play an active role in training militants and he too lives free in Pakistan. Little is known about what happened to the hijackers after they escaped to Pakistan. The plane that was hijacked was retired from service by Indian Airlines in 2001. So what do you think India should have done? Do you agree with India's approach to release the militants? Let me know in the comments below. This Air India Express plane is approaching runway 10 at Korikod International Airport. In it are people returning to India after being stuck in Dubai due to the COVID lockdowns. But this isn't going to be a happy ending. Because in five minutes, this plane is going to crash. At the end of the runway is a 110-foot cliff. The plane is going to touch down on the runway. The pilot will apply the brakes, but he won't be able to stop the plane. It'll overrun the runway fall down the cliff and break 
into three sections. This crash needn't have happened. Many unfortunate events, mostly man-made, combined to cause this tragedy. So the question now is, what just happened? Let's find out. This is the story of Air India Express 1344. Let's rewind to August 2020. Many people across the globe were stuck in other countries, unable to return home due to the sudden COVID lockdowns. And for people of the southern Indian state of Kerala, where Kori Code is situated, the Middle East is a popular tourist and expat destination. So to bring Indian citizens stranded outside the country back home, the Indian government organized repatriation flights. And one such flight was Air India Express 1344. The aircraft used for this flight was a 14-year-old Boeing 737-800, which first flew for Air India Express in 2006. Other than requiring minor maintenance work over the years, the plane was in a good condition with no major issues recorded. It's the morning of August 7th at Korikod. An empty flight with just the crew takes off at 4.49 UTC, headed for Dubai. The flight was flown by a 59-year-old captain and a 32-year-old first officer. After a short flight, it lands uneventfully at Dubai International Airport at 8.11 UTC. The return flight was scheduled to depart one and a half hours later at around 9.30 UTC. Due to COVID protocols, the boarding was slower than expected. This made the captain concerned and he was visibly anxious. The captain is going to play a major role in this incident. So let's talk about him. He was an ex-Indian military pilot and he had been working for Air India and then Air India Express from around the year 2000. He had around 11,000 hours of total flying experience, of which 4,500 hours were on the type. He had a medical history of diabetes, for which he was prescribed company-approved allopathic medications. But unknown to anyone at that time, he was also taking Ayurvedic medications for his diabetes. The combination of the two could lead to spikes in sugar levels and decreased situational awareness. The captain's training records had some curious remarks in them. Between the years 2009 and 2014, there were at least nine comments by trainers and supervisors that said, unsatisfactory, loses concentration when under stress, and tends to float during landings. The captain's home base was Mumbai, and he was repositioned to Kori Code on the 6th. He was scheduled to fly Flight 1344 to Dubai on the 7th, to be on standby duty on the 8th, and then had another Dubai flight on the 9th, before returning to Mumbai. Player number 2 in this incident is the airline, Air India Express. The way Air India Express bases its pilots is that the first officers are posted based on where they are required, but the captains can choose their home base as per their preference. This meant that at Kori Code, there were 26 first officers, but only one captain stationed. Due to the sudden increase in the number of repatriation flights, there weren't enough captains in Kori Code, and hence the captain of this flight was repositioned from Mumbai. The crew were undertaking their pre-flight checks when the captain got an update from Air India Express. The company had added an additional flight to the schedule and hence had to change the captain's roster. He was originally supposed to be on standby duty the next day. But as per the new schedule, he was now asked to fly a flight to Doha at 8.30 in the morning. Company policy required a minimum rest period of 12 hours between flights. And after adding on additional time for prep and for travel, the minimum gap required between the captain's two flights was 15 hours. Since his Dubai flight today was scheduled to return at 7 p.m. IST, the Doha flight the next day was rescheduled from 8.30 in the morning to 10 in the morning to get a 15-hour gap. But what this meant was that any delay to the landing time of this flight at Kori Code would delay the departure of his flight to Doha the next day. 
this last minute assignment put additional pressure on the captain to land back at Corey Code on time. This was a reason for the captain's anxiety when the boarding of passengers in Dubai was delayed. Now back to Dubai. 184 passengers and 10 infants boarded the flight and were eager to return to India after having spent an uncertain six months in Dubai. The pilots pushed back as soon as the doors closed and they departed Dubai at 1000 UTC. Destination Kolikot. Kolikot is situated in the Indian Peninsula. It experiences significant amount of rainfall due to its proximity to the Western Ghats to the east and to the Arabian Sea to its west. It's one of the wettest cities in India. And August is peak season for the southwest monsoon, which brings the city most of its rainfall. And on the day of the incident, the city was being battered by rain. The potential alternate airports for Kolikot were Tiruchirappalli, Coimbatore and Kochi. They chose Kochi as the alternate. Since both cities are on the same side of the Western Ghats, the weather in Kochi was very similar to that of Kolikot. It was raining and had a visibility of 2500 meters. Three and a half hours after leaving Dubai, and whilst 52 nautical miles from Kolikot Airport, the pilots got in touch with ATC, who relayed that the visibility at Kori Kod was 1,500 meters with a moderate thunderstorm, surface winds at 270 degrees at 14 knots. Kori Kod Airport is also going to play a crucial role in the story. This airport has what's called a tabletop runway. It was constructed by shaving off the top of a hill to create a flat tabletop. These runways have steep drops at both ends and on the sides. At the end of runway 10, the ground drops 110 feet. Here's a video of an Airbus landing on the runway and you can clearly see how steep the edges are on this runway. Kodikod Airport is non-standard in many ways. Every runway has a runway end safety area, a racer. The racer is designed using special material to prevent airplanes from overshooting the runway. Racers are supposed to be 90 meters by 90 meters, but due to the unavailability of land, the width of the racer here varied between 71 meters and 85 meters. The airport also has a non-standard runway width. Due to land availability restrictions, the airport was approved to have a runway width of 75 meters. The standard minimum width for a runway is 140 meters. The runway lighting at the airport was also non-standard. Again, due to the unavailability of land, the approach lights of the runway, which the pilots used to see and locate the runway, was permitted to be 150 meters. Standard length of approach lights is 900 meters. Due to how non-standard this runway is, Kodikod Airport is classified as a critical airport which means that only the captain is allowed to operate the flight from this airport. The co-pilot can only be pilot monitoring. Kodikod Airport was under two concurrent aerodrome warnings. One for the rain and two because the wind was exceeding 17 knots. The conditions were so dangerous that the airport had proactively stationed airport fire engines at predetermined points along the runway. During the approach, the plane was flying in light rain and moderate turbulence conditions. Now, we already know that the plane failed to stop on the runway once it landed at Kori Kod. To understand the reasons better, you need to understand the various mechanisms available to a pilot to stop a plane. Here's a quick guide. The first are the speed brakes. Remember when, as a kid, you used to put your hand out of the window of the car and you'd feel the force of the wind on your hand and there's resistance? That is exactly what a speed brake is. If your hands were large enough, that wind resistance could have stopped the car. And we can use that same principle to stop a plane. Once the airplane touches down, the computer senses an increase in the force of the wheels and immediately pops up huge panels above the wing, which increases the drag and decreases the speed. The second are the reversers. During normal flight, 
the engines create thrust in this direction, which causes the plane to move in the opposite direction. But when the reversers are enabled, there is a panel in the engine that opens up and directs the engine output in the opposite direction. This will cause the plane to want to go in reverse, thus slowing the plane down. The reversers are not automatically deployed and will need to be manually enabled by the pilot flying. The third is manual braking. This is similar to how you stop your car. The pilot can step on the brake pedals to invoke manual braking and bring the plane to a stop. And the last is auto braking. Due to the heavy workload that the pilots have during landing, the airplanes are designed to brake itself. For this, the pilots need to set the auto brake functionality to one of four values. These four values define how quickly the plane will come to a stop. When max is selected, the plane will stop at the shortest distance possible. And when one is selected, the plane will come to a more gradual stop. But when the pilot manually brakes, the auto brake is automatically disabled and the computer gives full control of braking to the pilots. Now in order to know what flap settings and auto brake values to use, the pilots are required to calculate a landing distance required value at every approach briefing. This needs to be done every time because no two approaches are ever the same. There could be differences in weather, aircraft weight and flying style to account for. But these pilots on this approach didn't calculate it. The captain had operated 36 flights in and out of Korikode Airport in the past one year. And he chose the auto brake and flap settings from memory. The plane was cleared for ILS approach for runway 28 at 13.44 UTC. The approach for runway 28 required the plane to fly to the VOR, overfly the runway, and then fly outward for a specific distance, do a U-turn, and then attempt the approach on runway 28. The ATC informed the crew that the runway visibility was 2000 meters and it was decreasing to 1500 meters. The wind was blowing from 280 degrees, there was light rain, and the runway surface was wet. The captain was concerned about visibility and instructed the first officer to ensure that the windshield wipers were working. You just see that this works. Remember, put it too high. And a minute later he said, Isko on kar dete hain. The first officer turned the wipers on. Both the captain and the co-pilot saw the runway laden lights. And at exactly the same time that they saw the lights, the captain's windshield wiper stopped working. Wiper is gone. What a day for the wiper to go. <laughs> Due to the sudden decrease in visibility because of the wiper stopping, the captain could no longer sight the runway and hence he decided to go around. They pressed the toga switch and applied max power and executed the go-around procedure. The aircraft was then cleared by ATC to climb to 10,000 feet. Now there was an opportunity here for the accident to be averted. But it was not taken. Air India Express's operating procedures requires that if the windshield wipers are not functioning during rain, then the plane has to divert to an airport where it isn't raining. Remember, Kori Code is a critical airport and hence the pilot monitoring wasn't allowed to land the plane even if he had a perfectly functioning wiper. Kochi, their chosen alternate, was also in rainy conditions. The nearest airport that had clear weather was Coimbatore. They had sufficient fuel to divert to their alternates. Fuel was not an issue. But at no point did the captain nor the first officer discuss the possibility of a diversion. At the same time that all of this was happening, an Air India Airbus A320 with call sign Air India 425 is preparing to take off from Kori Code, headed for Delhi. The current active runway is runway 28, but the pilot of Air India 425 requests the ATC for permission to take off from runway 10 instead. This is because there are active rain clouds over the direction of runway 28 and the Air India plane wanted to avoid it. The ATC accepted this request and immediately switched the active runway from runway 28 to 10 and gave Air India 425 taxi clearance to the runway. 
the ATC then asked the crew of Air India Express 1344 whether they would like to use runway 10 as well and reported that the current wind was at 270 degrees and at 8 knots. So I've been mentioning the wind speed and wind direction quite a few times in this video. Why is the wind speed and wind direction important? Let's take a look. Airplanes usually land and take off against the wind. This is also called headwind. This is because the aircraft's wings relies on the speed of the air moving over it to lift it off the ground. Here's an example. This is a small Cessna 172. The takeoff speed is approximately 55 to 60 knots. Keep an eye on the windsock at the back. It'll show you how fast the wind is blowing. I'm going to park the plane and then increase the wind speed to 55 knots. And as I keep increasing the wind, at one point, the plane just starts to fly. I admit it, it's not stable because I'm not controlling it. But this is a good illustration to show that it's not the ground speed of the plane on the runway, but rather the speed of the wind over the wings that matters. The higher the wind speed over the plane, the shorter the takeoff or landing distance. For example, here, the takeoff distance was 0 meters. Now, let's flip the wind direction. The little plane now has a tailwind. The wind is blowing from the right to the left. And as you can see, as I start increasing the wind speed, the wind is pushing the plane forward. It doesn't fly. So to stop this plane, I need to press the brakes harder to counteract the wind. Which means, if I land with a tailwind, I'm going to need a much longer landing distance to bring the plane to a stop. So at this point, the ATC has asked the pilots whether they'd like to land on runway 10 instead of runway 28. Runway 10 was the inferior of the two runways. It doesn't have lead-in lights and they would also be flying with a tailwind which would increase their landing distance. But on the other hand, remember the captain is under pressure to make sure his flight the next day isn't delayed. He needs to land this plane on time. He was already half an hour late when he took off from Dubai and he's now had to spend additional time due to the go-around. If he were to land on runway 28, he'd have to once again intercept the VOR, fly back over the runway, make a U-turn and then attempt the landing at runway 28. There's also this concern that the weather system that they are in right now would move over the runway whilst they are setting themselves up for runway 28. Visibility is 2000 meters. Wind is at 260 degrees at 5 knots. Considering all this, they decide to land on runway 10. And for the second time today, no calculation of the landing distance was done. The pilots didn't brief each other either. The flaps and auto brake settings were set from memory. The crew chose flaps 30. The correct setting for this approach was 40. The crew chose auto brake 3. The recommended value was max. At 1400 UTC, Air India Express 1344 was then cleared to approach runway 10. One minute later, the Air India flight to Delhi departed from runway 10. And by this time, the wind speed had doubled to 10 knots and was gusting from 270 degrees. At 1406, the aircraft was established on the localizer the captain then instructed the first officer, I'll tell you when to put it on. Thodi der mein karte hai. I hope it works. He was referring to the windshield wiper. A minute later, the wiper was turned on, but it was working at a much slower speed. Speed to itna hi rahegi? ATC cleared them to land on runway 10 with a visibility of 2000 meters and a wet runway surface. During landing, the plane needs to follow the glide slope. The glide slope is an imaginary 3 degree line from the end of the runway that planes follow for a normal landing. When the plane is on the glide slope, the pink diamond will be centered. The further the diamond is off center, the further away from the glide slope they are. Things are going to start happening very fast now. The already heavy workload on the crew is increasing significantly. The first officer disengaged the autopilot at 500 feet above the ground. 
The pitch of the plane reduced and the descent rate started to increase, touching 1500 feet a minute. The ideal descent rate is 750 feet per minute. The first officer cautioned the pilot about the high rate of descent. Rate of descent. Check. They were now 0.5 nautical miles from the runway. The airplane was well below the glide slope and was too close to the ground. The ground proximity warning system warned them with a glide slope, glide slope warning. The plane was around two dots away from the glide slope. This has now become a very unstabilized approach. Noticing that the captain hadn't reduced the rate of descent sufficiently, the first officer cautioned him again. Rate of descent, captain. Yeah, yeah. Correcting, correcting, correcting. It's time we talk about the final player in this incident, the first officer. The first officer was a 32-year-old male. He had a total flying experience of around 2,000 hours, having joined Air India Express just two years prior to the incident. The first officer was flying with a captain whom he had never flown with before, with a captain who was almost twice his age, who was ex-Indian military and was also a training captain within the company. Whereas the co-pilot himself had just two years of experience in the cockpit. The power gradient here was significant. Rate of descent, Captain. Yeah, yeah. Correcting, correcting, correcting. The captain corrected the descent and the plane momentarily went slightly above the glide slope. The plane crossed the threshold of runway 10 at a height of 92 feet. The engine thrust was at 61%. The auto throttle was commanding to reduce thrust to land the plane. But the captain increased the engine thrust to 83%. This caused the plane to not touch down and instead it just floated above the runway for the next 5 seconds. The first officer tried to get the captain's attention by saying, just check it. At this point, the aircraft was 2500 feet from the start of the runway and the touchdown zone would end in 500 feet. The touchdown zone is a marked area on the runway where the plane needs to land inside of in order to provide the pilots with sufficient distance to come to a stop. By not touching down in time, the plane was eating into valuable stopping distance. Remember, this plane is landing on a wet runway and with a tailwind, both of which would increase your landing distance. So it's important that they got this right. Also remember, these pilots hadn't calculated their actual landing distance during the approach. So they're basically just winging it. Two seconds later, the captain reduced the thrust to try to get the whales to touch the ground, but the plane had already crossed the end of the touchdown zone. The first officer said a feeble, Captain, go around. When a go-around call is given by either pilot, a go-around has to be carried out. Also, after two go-arounds, the pilots have to divert to an alternate airport and cannot attempt a third landing. But the captain here is under pressure to not delay the landing so that his flight the next day can take off on time. If he goes around now, he'll have to divert to Coimbatore. So, he ignores the go-around call. Due to the steep power gradient in the cockpit, the co-pilot doesn't override the captain and conduct the go-around himself. The plane touched down on the runway one second after the go-around call was made at 1410 UTC. The plane was traveling at around 165 knots at this point and it had already consumed 4,438 feet of the available 8,858 feet. The captain then applied max manual braking. The speed brakes were automatically deployed. The first officer made mandatory callouts. Speed brake, up, auto brake, disarm. But the captain didn't respond to these callouts. After three seconds, the captain deployed the thrust reversals, but then shut it off within two seconds before it had any impact. And at the same time that he shut off the reversers, he lifted his legs from the brake pedal, which reduced the braking effect. It is likely that he was in two minds about going around, but it was too late to spool the engines back up. But also, the plane wasn't stopping in time. He then applied the thrust reversers again. When the reversers hit maximum, the plane was already beyond the end of the runway and in the racer. Both pilots said, Shit. It exited the runway at a speed of 85 knots, way higher than what the racer was designed for. It broke the ILS antennas and a fence 
before plummeting down the cliff of the tabletop runway. The plane fell 110 feet down the cliff. Unfortunately, this impact resulted in the death of 21 people, including the two pilots. The primary cause of the accident was attributed to the pilot flying not following established procedures and not going around when the approach was unstabilized. The investigation team also found systemic failures within the airline's training and rostering procedures and the airport's design and certification as contributing factors to the incident. The investigators found that Air India Express didn't have its own simulators and was instead using those of Air India. And those simulators weren't properly maintained and had multiple flaws in how it performed. Due to this, the pilots were learning incorrect techniques in the simulator, what the industry refers to as negative training. Recommendations were also made to improve the runway lighting at Kodikod Airport and to also increase the RESA at both ends of the runway. The runway lighting was upgraded in October 2023, three years after the incident. There were 37 other recommendations that were made, which are all available in the final report that I have linked in the video description. Captain, do you know where we are? Kuch nahi dikhai de raha. I can't see anything. Attempting to land, going blindly. Trivandrum, Kerala. The pilots and passengers of this Jet Airways flight from Qatar to India are now in a desperate fight for survival. Terrible weather and the lack of ILS has made it impossible for the pilots to spot the runway. The pilots have tried to land this plane not once, not twice, not thrice, but six times already. They have been circling the airports for well over two hours. And now they are critically low on fuel. They literally have just 10 minutes of fuel left. In zero visibility, they are so close to the ground that the GPWS warnings start blaring Terrain, terrain, pull up! And if they cannot land this plane in the next 10 minutes, there is a very real possibility that they'll crash in the heart of Trivandrum city. How did they let things get so, so bad? This is a real story behind the Bollywood movie, Runway 34. It's a story about how one poor decision by one person can put the lives of 150 people in danger of imminent death. This is the story of Jet Airways Flight 555. It's August 17th, 2015, and this is Hamad International Airport in Doha, Qatar. A Jet Airways Boeing 737-800 is preparing for a four-hour flight to Cochin International Airport in the southern Indian state of Kerala. The pilots rostered for today's flight had flown this plane from Cochin to Doha the previous day, and they've had more than 24 hours to rest between the two flights. The Doha to Cochin sector is one of Jet Airways' most popular routes, and today's flight was no different. This plane was carrying 142 passengers and eight crew members on board. The plane used today is a Boeing 737-800, the world's most widely used narrow-body aircraft. It is powered by two GECFM-56 turbofan engines, which consume approximately 500 kilos of fuel every 10 minutes. Now keep this in mind as this story is about to turn into a major fuel nightmare. The flight time is four hours and it's flown by two pilots. The captain was pilot flying and the first officer was pilot monitoring. The captain is 40 years old and he had around 6,700 hours of total flying experience, with most of his experience being on the type. The first officer is much younger. He's 25 years old. He's only had around 1,500 hours of total flying experience, and he's had about 600 hours on the type. Notice the steep discrepancy in the age and the relative experience of the two pilots. This power gradient will soon become an issue in the story. Now, this flight was a night flight, and it's scheduled to depart at around 10.30 p.m. local time. The entire flight was going to occur in the window of circadian low. It's the time between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., the time when people are usually sleeping, where the body's alertness drops. You would have noticed this when you try to work late into the night. During this period, the pilots experience drowsiness and their decision-making skills and alertness might be compromised. The crew met up two hours prior to prepare for the flight. When they received the weather report for Cochin, they realized that the weather report was created 10 hours ago 
and they didn't have a more recent one. So they had to base their entire planning on this dated information. And that report indicated that Cochin had a good weather with visibility of 4,000 meters, with a mild 5 knot crosswind, scattered clouds at 1,500 feet, and broken clouds at 9,000 feet. Their uh, chosen alternate was Bengaluru. Now, although closer airports like Thiruvananthapuram and Kolikod existed, the cities on the western side of the Western Ghats tend to have similar weather due to the effects of the Western Ghats mountain range. Since an alternate airport needs to have better weather than your primary destination, they chose Bengaluru, which is on the other side of the mountains. And Bengaluru had a visibility of 8,000 meters, wind at 290 at 10 knots, scattered clouds at 1,200 feet, and broken clouds at 8,000 feet. They chose Coimbatore as their secondary alternate. They then calculated how much fuel they'd require for this trip. There are guidelines and regulations that govern how much fuel needs to be on board the plane before takeoff. And here's how that's calculated. You start by computing the kilos of fuel required to taxi the plane at both the origin and at the destination. For 18 minutes of taxi, they added about 216 kilos of fuel. To this, they added the trip fuel. The trip fuel is the amount of fuel required from accelerating down the runway at Doha, flying all the way to India, and then to exiting the runway at Cochin. The trip fuel was 11,112 kilos, 4 hours and 7 minutes of total fuel burn. To this, they added 14 minutes of contingency fuel to give them a buffer in case something goes wrong along the way. For example, an unplanned rerouting by ATC to avoid thunderstorms. Jet Airways mandated the contingency fuel to be 5% of the trip fuel. To this, they added the alternate fuel of 2,178 kilos to give them about 44 minutes of flying time to get them to Bengaluru airport in case they were unable to land at Cochin. And to this, they added the final reserve fuel. The final reserve fuel is the amount of fuel required to fly for 30 minutes at 1,500 feet over their alternate airport, in this case, Bengaluru. And for this flight, that number was calculated to be 1128 kilos. They also added 105 kilos for the APU burn as required by the airline. This brought the absolute minimum fuel to 15,295 kilos. Due to the possibility of poor weather over Cochin, the captain considered that additional hold time may be required and hence added an additional 750 kilos of fuel for 19 minutes of hold. So in all, they took on about 16,100 kilos of fuel, giving them a total engines on time of 6 hours and 13 minutes. Okay, now let's get back to Doha, Qatar. The passengers have boarded the plane and the plane is ready to depart. They pushed back at 1920 UTC and they departed Doha at 1937 UTC, headed to Kochi, India. A four-hour flight was ahead of them. Three and a half hours later, they arrived near India's west coast and they got in touch with Kochi ATC. The time is now 4.30 a.m. IST. The ATC informed them that the latest weather at Kochi was visibility at 3,500 meters in hazy conditions with few clouds at 1,500 feet and scattered clouds at 8,000 feet. This wasn't too different to what the pilots were expecting to hear and so they continued their approach towards Cochin. Now let's get familiar with Kochi Airport. This is a single runway airport with runways 0927. The active runway this morning was 27. The approach for runway 27 requires the pilots to fly over the runway to a VOR, fly out east at a heading of 097, and then turn around to a heading of 271 to position themselves for a landing. The plane arrived overhead at Kochi Airport at 5.20 am, and they were cleared by ATC to approach runway 27. And at this time, they had 4,844 kilos of fuel available. This is going to be their first landing attempt for the day. The ATC reached out with updated weather information. The visibility had reduced to 3,000 meters and it was trending lower. There was fog all over the runway and on the approach path. The plane entered the cloud layer and the captain's forward visibility dropped dramatically. They couldn't see anything outside the window. As they continued towards the runway, they checked their approach charts. The minimum visibility for this runway was 650 meters and the decision altitude was 320 feet. If they couldn't see the runway at 320 feet, they'll have to go around. 
The crew continued with the approach, hoping to see the runway in due course. They extended their flaps and brought the gear down. As the plane continued to descend down the glide slope, the weather continued to worsen. As the plane dropped below 1000 feet, nothing was visible. They then hit their decision altitude. The runway was nowhere to be seen. So, at 2.56 feet, they pressed the toga switch, applied max power and executed their first go-around. The time is 5.28 am India time. The pilot flying then followed the missed approach procedure and joined the holding pattern over Cochin. The fuel on board dropped to 4,699 kilos. The minimum fuel required for a diversion to Bengaluru was 3,306 kilos. While holding, they checked what the weather was like at their planned alternates, Bengaluru and Coimbatore. The crew also requested the ATC to provide them with weather for Trivanandapuram. So why Trivanandapuram? The captain reasoned that if they decided to divert to Trivanandapuram instead of Bengaluru, that would give them an additional 20 minutes of holding time at Cochin, maybe allowing them to do two more approaches if needed. Since Tiruvannandapuram wasn't in their original plans, the first officer checked the notams for that airport. The notam stated that the ILS at Trivandrum airport was down for maintenance. This meant that the crew needed good visibility at Trivandrum if they were to land there. The visibility at Trivandrum was reported to be 3000 meters with clouds at 1500 feet. This was above the minimums required for a VOR approach and so the captain was confident that he could land the plane if they decided to divert there. Whilst they were in their holding pattern, two Air India Express planes were on final approaches into Cochin. The first one landed and reported sighting the runway at 1400 feet. The second one attempted to land but they couldn't see the runway at their decision altitude. They reported clouds as low as 600 feet and informed the ATC that the visibility had dropped to 2400 meters. The ATC relayed this information to the Jet Airways crew. Given that the first Air India Express plane was able to land, the Jet Airways crew decided to begin their second attempt. As the plane descended and reached its decision altitude, just like the first attempt, they still couldn't see the runway. So, they executed their second go around for the day at 5.47 am local time and entered the holding pattern again. The fuel on board had dropped to 3,919 kilos. The minimum fuel required to go to Bangalore was 3,306 kilos. A third attempt to land at Cochin would cost them around 800 kilos of fuel, placing them under the minimum fuel for Bangalore. So if they were to divert to Bangalore, they should divert now. But remember, the captain was wanting to go to Thirumanandapuram to gain some additional holding time at Cochin. The captain discussed this plan with the first officer. However, the first officer was concerned that since the ILS wasn't working at Tirvanandapuram and since the visibility at Tirvanandapuram wasn't better than Cochin, they might not be able to land at Trivandrum either. He was also concerned that the presence of haze and the rising sun might make visibility worse. The captain assured him that if Trivandrum got worse, they could then divert to Coimbatore as their alternate, as it was closer to Cochin. But curiously, they never checked the weather for Coimbatore. Remember the power gradient in the cockpit that I mentioned? It's starting to play a factor here. The crew then informed the ATC that they were redesignating Trivandrum as their alternate. At the same time, a Kuwait Airways plane attempted to land but executed a go-around because it couldn't spot the runway either. And based on updated information from the Kuwait plane, the ATC informed the Jet Airways crew that the visibility was now 1500 meters with low clouds at 400 feet. The weather had further deteriorated. The ATC now asked the Jet Airways crew to state their intentions. The captain informed the ATC that he wanted to attempt to land at Cochin one more time and if that landing was unsuccessful, then he diverted to Trivandrum. The plane now spent an additional 30 minutes holding over Cochin, burning fuel all along. The ATC then advised them of the latest weather. Tempo visibility reducing to 1500 meters in mist and low clouds now at 400 feet. The weather had further deteriorated. And at this time, the weather is worse than either of the previous two attempts. No plane has landed at the airport in the past 30 minutes. But despite this, the captain decides to begin the third attempt to land. Landing gear down, flaps out, minimus reached, they still couldn't see the runway. 
So, they executed a third go-around for the day. The ATC now vectored them to intercept the 180 radial for Cochin and to climb to 4,000 feet. This heading would get them to Trivandrum. Their current fuel on board is 2,644 kilos. The minimum fuel for Bangalore is 3,306 kilos. Bangalore was no longer an option. The minimum fuel for Trivandrum was 2,614 kilos. They had no room for error in Trivandrum. Those additional 30 kilos gives them one extra minute of flying time. Also, because they were heading towards Trivandrum, Coimbatore was no longer an option as well. Whilst they were on their way to Trivandrum, they were cleared to climb to flight level 210. Five minutes later, Trivandrum ATC informed Cochin ATC that the visibility at Trivandrum had dropped to 1,500 meters and asked them to relay this to Jet Airways 555. Cochin ATC acknowledged it, but failed to pass this information on to the Jet Airways plane. The crew were flying towards Trivandrum, unaware of the deteriorated conditions there. The weather at Trivandrum was now no different to that of Cochin. Time to now familiarize ourselves with Trivandrum Airport. The Trivandrum Airport is located in the heart of the city, just a couple of kilometers inland from the Arabian Sea. And like many Kerala airports, Trivandrum has a single runway, runway 1432. And the active runway this morning was runway 14, approaching from the north. At 6.30 a.m. local time, as they neared Trivandrum, the crew got in contact with Trivandrum ATC. The ATC relayed the current weather, visibility at 1500 meters, wind at 290, scattered clouds at 1500 feet and at 2500 feet. The ATC cleared them for the VOR approach into runway 14. The 1500 meter visibility was now an issue because the minimus to begin a VOR approach in Trivandrum was 2100 meters. The minimum decision altitude is 650 feet. This meant that legally the pilots cannot begin this approach at this runway in the current conditions. But remember, the fuel continues to be an issue. The crew then asked the ATC whether they had high visibility lighting because they wanted to use a workaround called converted meteorological visibility. When the approach lights are much brighter, the pilots can see the runway from much further away. And in those cases, the pilots can use this table to convert the reported visibility into a converted met visibility to obtain a higher visibility number. However, this conversion can and should only be done if high visibility lighting exists at the airport. But the ATC responded to the crew that the runway only had basic lighting and had no high visibility lighting. But despite the lack of such lighting, the captain made the calculations and obtained a converted met visibility value of 2,250 meters. This was higher than the 2,100 meters required for the VOR approach. So he checked the box and continued towards Trivandrum. When the plane was 25 nautical miles from Trivandrum airport, the captain realized that they were too high to begin the approach and requested for a right 360 orbit to reduce the height. The crew spent time and fuel completing this turn to reduce their altitude. This unplanned maneuver further reduced the available fuel and sent the plane into a minimum fuel state. Whilst not yet an emergency, a minimum fuel call signifies that an emergency situation could arise if further delays occur. The ATC then vectored Jet Airways 555 for a straighten approach to runway 14 with a visibility of 2000 meters. At 6.50 a.m. local time, the plane approached the minimum decision altitude, but once again, they were unable to spot the runway. They executed their fourth go around for the day. The fuel on board dropped to 1,324 kilos. The final reserve fuel is 1,300 kilos. When the plane goes under final reserve, the crew needs to declare an emergency. And an emergency opens up all airports and all approaches for them. After two minutes, the fuel dropped below 1300 kilos and the first officer made the emergency call to the ATC. Things are going to get very interesting. With their options reducing, the captain requested permission from the ATC to conduct a visual approach into runway 14. Now, to do a visual approach, you need clear visibility of the runways and of the approach path. This captain has just done an instrument approach and he couldn't see the runway. But he was now requesting permission to do a non-instrument approach in zero visibility. The reason he's asking for this is because in visual approaches, you can take a much tighter path, reducing the amount of time required to land. But under the current visibility conditions, this is a significant gamble. 
At this point of time, the pilots had been flying this plane for more than five hours right through the window of circadian low. And with almost no fuel in the plane, panic is setting in and the crew are making some questionable calls. But they are almost out of options. Since this is an emergency plane, the ATC cleared them for a visual approach into runway 14. The crew made a right-hand turn and stabilized the plane at 1,000 feet. This is much lower than the usual altitude to begin a visual approach. On the downwind leg, as they flew abeam the threshold for runway 14, they informed the ATC that they are initiating a right-hand turn to land. The ATC was concerned that this was way too close for them to be able to turn into final, and they asked the crew to confirm that they could actually see the runway. The crew continued to descend, and they turned the plane towards the airport. However, during this approach, the crew were not in visual contact of the runway at any time. They turned into final blindly. And by the time they sighted the runway, they realized that they were way too high to be able to land the plane. So, they had to initiate their fifth go-around for the day. Things are going to get even worse. The fuel depleted to 898 kilos. They had around 15 minutes of flying time left before they would completely run out. The captain then again requested the ATC for another visual approach into runway 14. The ATC informed the crew that the visibility remained unchanged and it was still at 2000 meters, asking them to confirm whether they wanted to try immediately. But with just 15 minutes of fuel left, they had to attempt it again. They initiated their sixth landing attempt. Since they were too high on the previous approach, the crew compensated by descending to 1000 feet and further descending to 500 feet on the base turn. This is very low for a standard visual approach. On the base leg, they were still not able to make contact with the runway and once again turned blindly into final. When they spotted the runway, this time they were too low and they were further to the right. The captain manhandled the yoke and turned it to the left. The plane banked so hard that they got a bank angle, bank angle warning. They were too close to the runway to stabilize the plane in time and they had to conduct their sixth go around for the day. The fuel is now at 662 kilos and they have about 10 minutes of flying time left. With almost no options left, the captain climbed the plane to 700 feet. They realized that they don't have time to do a full circuit to approach runway 14 anymore. The captain informs ATC that he intends to do a 180 degree turn to land on the opposite runway, runway 32 instead. Like it or not, this is their final landing attempt. Because if they don't land the plane this time, they will run out of fuel. And since they are flying over the heart of the capital city of Kerala, they'll inevitably crash in a populated area. But the plane is still inside the clouds. The captain can't see anything irrespective of which runway he's landing on. Without being able to see where they are, they blindly start descending down to the ground. The ground proximity warning Terrain, terrain, pull up blares in the cockpit. They were so low that the captain was able to see houses and people on the ground. But the forward visibility was still poor and the runway was still not in sight. Terrain, terrain, pull up. The first officer inhibits the warning. They disconnect the autopilot. Captain, do you know where we are? Kuch nahi dikhai de raha. I can't see anything. Attempting to land, going blindly. As they fly closer, they can see a vague outline of the runway over to their left. They are once again not aligned. They bank hard to the left. They are just 50 feet above the runway at this point. The approach lights become visible and they finally find themselves somewhat aligned with the center line. The captain forces the nose of the plane down. And at 7.10 a.m. they finally land on runway 32. As the plane rolled down the runway, the final fuel was 349 kilos. They had around 5 minutes of fuel left. They then taxied and parked the plane at the gate. A few hours later, the weather improved. They fueled up, the passengers boarded the plane, and the same crew took off again towards Cochin. The final report attributed the cause 
to an absence of company policy about the number of approaches and go arounds that a crew can attempt at an airport it also attributed it to a lack of policy around the redesignation of an alternate airport during inclement weather the poor decisions made by the crew to redesignate trivandrum as an alternate airport when the airport had similar weather and worse navigational aids were also highlighted the aibb also recommended that low fuel scenarios and decision making training be added to the training sessions for pilots a plane is on fire mayday 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 the captain has just heard a deafening bang from the cargo hold there is smoke seeping into the cockpit alarms are blaring instruments are failing they are losing control of the plane the atc is on the line helpless is it in the back but behind the scenes something far more dangerous is unfolding a chain of events that will spark decades of speculation government cover ups conflicting reports and whispers of something far more sinister click here to watch the story of the helderberg incident